हेलो एंड वेलकम टू पी एल्स फर्स्ट पॉडकास्ट एज वी नो मार्केट्स ट्राई टू लुक इन टू फ्यूचर एंड इट्स फ्यूचर दैट ड्राइव्स मार्केट्स हु कैन बी बेटर एट दिस जंक्चर दैन माई डियर फ्रेंड जीतु पंजाबी हु है बीन एडवाइजिंग ऑलमोस्ट इक्वल टू इंडियाज जी डी पी एसेट्स एट कैपिटल इंटरनेशनल एंड हु हैज बीन दी ओनली वन ऑन द स्ट्रीट predicting a super cycle in the midst of covid he comes with his new paper saying super cycle is over world is in disequilibrium us influence is at its peak and this is not all it can be a world war 3 so let's hear it out from he himself as to what is prompting these thoughts and these views by jitu punjabi so jitu there is no good news from you you've been saying that the super cycle is over and we are in for recession why do you think so uh so first thank you for the very kind words of introduction that you made and uh, you know when two years ago when we talked about the super cycle and uh, our our data basically predicted that we're going to have a 10% dollar gdp growth for the next 18 months now that for the world at large for a world that's growing in 3 and 4% that definitely Precisely. puts demand pressure on a lot of metrics and that's what creates a super cycle uh we're very clear that that we were very fortunate played out that way our analytics saw it but we thank god for Uh, having us analytically right uh, we we way. do linear strategy analytics and non linear strategy analytics and mm-hmm. we caught it the non linear analytics and this is what we expect uh, but the good news uh, or the bad news is that's over and we're now seeing that growth is coming back usually does not come back to zero it swings mm. the other way mm. we can see that there's an inventory recession coming up and it's visible in the data we can see a lot of material industries when you see the compression in supply times and the inventory on the high seas all the data put together tells us that there is a recession pretty much happening right now mm-hmm. but the data is going to show in the next 3 to 6 months so the key message is super cycle over us and europe you've got a recession it will probably be visible in the data next 3 to 6 months and the good news on that is that the fed's going to probably slow down on its rate hike cycle that you that they articulated and what everybody was expecting and uh, things are going to be trying to normalize from here after we see this recession it will be a short and sharp recession it's not going to be a deep 18 month recession okay but you will see a change in policy in the next 3 to 4 months and so will the markets rise again in the short term so in the short term we're expecting markets uh, to be positive to rally on two counts one mm. obviously the expectation from the fed is changing or going to change and two we also expect a greater activity levels in china driven by policy and driven by uh, the fiscal side as well so we expect china to step on the gas and together that could provide the stimulus to markets and we we think the next 3 to 6 months maybe 9 months looks good for markets before again creating other problems that we expect over the next Four or five years, so we're we're thinking five six years for now, and uh, we're very worried for the next five six years. So short term, you are a little comfortable, but you still think that the trio of excess liquidity globally and interest rate, commodity prices playing havoc, and the global growth will keep intersecting with each other. and have its impact on the markets absolutely and i'll add one more element to that the global geopolitics exactly it was global, about to come globalization to are both in disequilibrium so so amisha let me let me lay out uh, what's changed from our in our in our analytics as we look at the last 60 or 90 days we think that four big 40 year trends have changed okay so you had 40 years of the disinflation that game is over you had 40 years of rates going down that's over you had 40 years of globalization that's over and you had 40 years of some sort of semblance of equilibrium in geopolitics that's over okay so you have four 40 year trends changing currently at this point the implications of which 
are going to be very very significant now normatively as you know in markets uh, or or in macro you have a model which says we revert to mean so if things mm. go down more than you normally expect mm. you think they'll come back or if things go up more than you expect they'll come back but when a 40 year trend is changed there is no mean to revert to so all analytical models that use reversion to mean as the mm. base are going to be flawed be able to predict. yeah and they're not going to be able to predict and thus we're thinking now 5 to 7 years what do we think are, is going to happen what are the implications of that on the macro what are the implications on the corporate sector what are what are the implications on markets and thus how do we navigate and being a businessman is going to be really tough being an investor is going to be equally tough and S- thus thus the title of a note the world in disequilibrium correct and as we deep dive a bit into your this title of world being in disequilibrium so what is thrown world into this disequilibrium is Russia Ukraine war one of the catalysts to that and why so absolutely the Russia Ukraine war was uh, you know the, was a symptom of the core issues that were building up geopolitically globally mm. in our view okay mm. Mm. so so the fact that you've had you've had uh, you US geopolitics with the rest of the world being shaken up you've seen divides widening you've seen China rising the western world not giving enough space for china to rise you've seen we have very strong leaders in the world each one wanting their own internal political agendas come into the court i think these there's a multitude of various different reasons that are playing out all over the world which culminate into the symptoms that was the war mm. which culminate into global supply chains getting battered Correct. or getting questioned uh, and then the next implication is you're going to see you've seen inflation and in our view inflation is going to need brand new supply chains to get built which means inflation again and thus the rate cycle changes from a 4 5 year perspective all this is going to have implications and that's that's the core of why the world is in disequilibrium but as what uh, heard of late that the way russia russia ukraine war played out lasted longer and still somewhere the us influence seems to be reducing do you subscribe to that absolutely and, not uh, no <laughs> <laughs> no no uh, well uh, i my personal opinion us is core to this battle us is playing a proxy war uh, if you if you were to ask me my guess the missiles being fired out of ukraine are possibly con- being controlled by the us right i don't think there's enough trained people in ukraine in war in firing missiles that can fire these missiles so it's a us battle it's a proxy battle and uh, us is the core of it and it's all a lot of domestic politics is driving this a lot of insecurities and in various political leaders minds driving this so i don't i don't think us is us is out of this influence is not yet Uh, reducing at all, and they are in the midst. So How you, are, you know, US is US is twenty five percent of world GDP. It's a twenty five trillion dollar economy on a hundred trillion dollar base. So when we when we wrote our last note, if you remember, we said belt up for a coming global super cycle and a hundred trillion dollar world mm. in twenty twenty three. We were wrong. It was not twenty twenty three. In twenty twenty two, we have a hundred trillion dollar world. US is a twenty five trillion dollar economy. If we look at a hundred-year time span, the last fifty and the next fifty, this probably marks the peak of U.S. share of world output and U.S. influence and U.S. power. Because my view is that the U.S. is going to be heading south, not oh. north, as we navigate the next five, six years. So, what will really trigger that? Okay, great that question. Mm. Great question. Okay, so let me let me articulate what I think our roadmap for the next five, six years looks like. Right. So as a function of the symptoms of this Russia Ukraine crisis we think there's an eastern bloc being formed the eastern bloc today mm. is basically China and Russia correct probably an Iran is part of it in our view India is trying to stay neutral as long as it can okay as long as it can we've heard Jay Shankar multiple times we've seen a lot of the actions that India's done we're trying to stay neutral as long as we can in my view two or three or four years from now india is going to be leaning into the eastern bloc and my hold your breath even japan four or five years now is going to lean into this bloc 
and as the as the as as China and Japan and India and Japan also lead into this block, you're creating an Eastern bloc that's probably 65 percent of the world population, a third of the world output, uh, a large part of where the demand side is going to grow over the next 10, 15 years, and the most important point is that this is the one that is the that has a surplus to the external balance sheet of the U.S. Now the external balance sheet of the mm. U.S. is the part of the U.S. which is the greatest imbalance for the world or the biggest imbalance economic imbalance to the world today is the external balance sheet of the U.S. It's a 16 trillion dollar deficit, 10 trillion debt, 6 trillion equity. The 10 trillion debt deficit of the balance sheet was 3 trillion dollars just seven years ago. So it's gone oh, from it's three, almost triple. It's tripled in the last seven years. The creditors to this balance sheet is Japan and China and large parts of Asia. So, you know, yeah, some of we the all have funded their Middle relentless East. current deficit. Correct. The external balance external sheet. External balance sheet. Correct. So uh, the implications of that is as this Eastern Bloc gets formed, U.S. is obviously not happy. NATO is not happy, but the external balance sheet gets pulled. The rug gets pulled over there. We'll see the dollar start. The impl first implication is the dollar falls five, six, seven percent. This triggers a U.S. reaction because imported inflation goes up in the U.S., mm. catalyzing the current inflation pressures in the U.S. There's a social crisis in the U.S., which is much worse. We saw what happened in Chicago yesterday. These are early symptoms of a core problem over there. You'll see prob similar problems in the in Europe as well as the migrant issue gets worse and you'll see the inflation get much worse in the US over the next three, four, five years. The dollar starts falling, the beneficiary is the Eastern Bloc. So Asian currencies appreciate. It may take a while to play out, mm. maybe it takes three, four years before we see the big turn happen. But when this happens, US is going to retaliate. No world power, world dominant power gives up its position Precisely. without a fight. What is US strongest at? Defense. That's defense. And what does US do? Get its guns out. Gets its defense out. So, so are my you view, thinking a possibility of a Yeah, the sad a, news a, a is that war? sad, sad news that history suggests that we probably could have a World War Three on a five, six year time frame, maybe earlier, maybe later. We're not timelining it, we're milestoning it. So mm. depend on the series of events, we will be timelining it. But the point is that a major, major conflict in the world is pretty likely. The bad news is that this, any significant conflict in the world creates disequilibrium in profits. And markets, mm. participants like us, we pay a PE for certainty and equilibrium of profits. Mm. The minute you have disequilibrium in profits, you have disequilibrium in capital allocation, you have disequilibrium in market prices, it's going to be a very, very difficult world. I'm not saying the world markets will collapse. All I'm saying is that you could have huge volatility, mm. huge bouts of bad news and some good news, and you're going to have to navigate this. This is the core of my five, seven year roadmap, which says the world in disequilibrium. I think so, I'm going to be analytically challenged. So we're going to have to figure a way how to navigate this. It's going to be a tough time ahead. The way I hear you, it seems that the long said story of buy and hold maybe will be challenged and <coughs> one will have to be very nimble footed. I think so. I think so. I, th I think you're on the ball there. So the way I kind of, if I take the last 20 or 30 returns, uh, 30 year returns on the Indian markets is probably 11 or 11 and a half percent, right? Mm, mm. With very low levels of volatility. True. So the point was buy and hold was great and SIP was great. It worked well. What do I think the next four or five years does? And I'm just throwing a guess, maybe six, seven, eight percent, mm. right? But with mu very significant volatility. volatility. So you're going to have to navigate that. Can volatility be your friend? Yes. Can you trade? Yes. Is it, is it going to be tough? Absolutely. Mm. Is it going to be extremely dark at the bottom? Yes. Is it going to be uncertain at the top? Yes. So it will be a tough market environment to navigate through. That's the way we see it. And all this you're predicting at a time when India has just set its stage to be the world superpower, so to say, or next 10 years, as we all believe, will belong to India. 
So all this which is happening around us in the world, how is it going to impact India? Is it going to help us achieve our goals and targets and our due recognition and position? Or it's going to hamper us? So I think it's a great, it's a great question, Amisha. And that is really something we've thought a fair bit about. I think it's still work in progress. But summarily, I would say that India is in a sweet spot. Mm. Okay. So the Western world needs India to battle China, which is growing. Okay. Mm. China needs India if it wants to rise as the Middle Kingdom against the West. So India is in a sweet spot geopolitically and I think Jay Shankar and Modi and team are doing a fantastic job. Fantastic job in positioning correctly and staying neutral as long as they can. Do I think India's rise is a given? I think so. I'll, I'll throw one piece of data to you which might not be very publicly viewed. If you look at the demographics of India. Take a period 2020 to 2030. Mm. What is the accretion to working age population in various parts of the world? US, negative. Eurozone, negative. Japan, negative. So US, True. US, Eurozone, Japan, China, all are aging. All are aging and all have roughly flat working age accretion to, po- uh, to the populations. Correct. Indonesia, is at 22 million over 10 years. So roughly 2 million a year. Mm. Guess what the India number is? 122 million. Wow. So India is the outlier in terms of adding to the working age population. And earning population. And earning population. They're going to earn. The upside risk is if these people get employed well and create value. The downside risk is if you can't create enough employment. My view is probably a million a year will immigrate and go overseas. Maybe they don't if the world environment is not that great. Mm. But India definitely demographically is a bright spot. Okay. The second part is if I'm looking at from a return on equity, which is the corporate sector's earning uh, between the mid 90s and 2007, Indian mm. ROEs were between 13 to 17 mm. percent. Okay. Post the financial crisis and for whatever governance reasons, India went down after 2009, we saw this number come down to 9 to 10 percent, mm. right? For the first time in our view, we're going back to 15, 16. So the macro tailwinds are transmitting into return on equities, which are transmitting to markets. Mm. So which is a structural positive to markets. So you have tailwind of people Correct. creating value and you've got tailwind of corporate sector transmitting the value to markets. So we're very, very positive about India in a global context, in the ability to create value. But what we're worried about is that the world's not going to be a great place to be in. And it's going in, to that, in that uh, disequilibrium the world is creating, uh, obviously the Indian corporate sector is going to have to battle with that. You know, with prices, material prices going crazy, supply chains breaking down, demand, external demand possibly going through big hoops. And it's not going to be an easy world, but India is really the bright a bright spot in the in a, in a world that's not going to be very happy. You are so bullish on India, and every other person whom I meet, who's who's who in investment world, is bullish on India. But last six months, <clears throat> we are seeing only and only negative FIA flows. Why is that? Complete disconnect. Look, I think I mean uh, what seems. What, what my analysis over there is that in, you're a victim of your success in part. You're the one country that's done well. Mm. EM, Emerging Markets, is not a great is not a great acronym today. EM funds have not done too well, uh, partly because of Russia, partly because of China. So if there's fund selling in an EM fund, then India is part of it. You have to sell, mm. and part of it is that India has become large, very large in some portfolios and you have a lot of profits there sitting there and you want to take some profit off the table for various reasons. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't read the last six or nine months to, as, a, to, as a negative view on India. Got it. I think you're a victim of what's happening in the neighborhood as well as a victim of your success. Got it. This is a very good clarification and all those Indian retailers, retail savings which has been coming into markets will 
find a good solace in the fact that they are at the right position right time and they are holding up the markets as we all know absolutely absolutely my humble view is today us is probably the capital allocator of the world mm. okay it's simple if someone in singapore or someone in hong kong wants to invest in a hedge fund the hedge fund is usually resident in the us so you mm. give them half a million or a million or mm. five million or 10 million dollars and the us allocates it and part of it would come to india and part mm. would go wherever else it goes i don't think that money originates in the us so if i look at Got the international it. investment position it tells you that the us is the capital allocator of the world one okay two i think the indian savings pool is large enough to fund india's savings needs so you really don't need that external so capital so much dependence and we've seen the indian savings pool come up and neutralize a lot of the foreign selling so in my humble opinion it doesn't it's not going to matter at a point as it did 10 years ago the an average indian in, investor wanted to buy gold and real mm. estate that's reduced significantly you've seen his fixed income appetite has come off you've seen his equity appetite go up i think these are longer term trends so as you see mm. the next 5 7 years i think the need for external money is going to reduce may not be the determining factor so to say correct but uh, does that money still going to come yes and these are yeah. long trends it takes many years to play out and i think you'll still have fdi you'll still see i i would bet every single boardroom ask their ceo what's your india strategy right mm -hmm. so they're going to have to need to have an india strategy they're going to have to say that yes we're creating a base in india or we're creating a because india is gaining relevance in the market i mean you can see it Absolutely. in a lot of discussions in media globally So I I don't see that money going away but I think the need and the relevance of that money is not going to be as much as it was in the last 10 years. Very good insight once again. And as we now focus a bit more on Indian markets. How would you play Indian markets sectorially? We know 30 35% plus weight is with banking and financials and last 10 years belong to NBFCs non-banking finance companies. we also know that the banks balance sheets are at their best at this juncture how would you play these two and bfsi as a segment okay so let me let me answer this with first two overarching comments okay one i'm going to be extremely extremely cautious in whatever i do hmm okay so my 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 objective would be don't try to make that extra buck make sure you're analytically right mm. the risk is low and you're managing to keep your capital okay the second comment i would make is that there's a theme that you would look for markets which is to find continuity in a discontinuous world mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so we articulated the world in disequilibrium mm. that translates into discontinuity in markets Mm. and how do i find continuity in a discontinuous world okay mm. so a lot of sexy things that might be flavor of the season flavor of the day flavor of the week might not necessarily be the right place to be in mm. in that framework so i i would i would be risk averse and i would look for continuity in discontinuity having said that now getting down to your point mm. of saying where do we see opp opportunity sectorally i think banking and finance is a need you're providing fuel to businesses you are providing mm. fuel to the household balance sheet the corporate balance sheet the government balance sheet and that's a need okay are there good hands managing good financials that are going to serve this need absolutely would i participate with them of course i would mm. so do i think that's a great place to be i think so and history suggests that they've managed to make a decent roe they've had a decent comparative position under decent hands when a bank went into the wrong hands we've seen what outcomes Absolutely. have played out Correct. so do i think that as a sector would be a great place to be i think so i think in the theme of con finding continu continuity in a discontinuous world a lot of consumer themes would play out there do we think that that's a great place to be again i think so okay uh, would you have to analytic analytically figure out uh, where do you, what's the right place to be at the right time at the right valuation in the right hands I think there's no better people than you to advise <laughs> investors on that. The third thing I think is uh in my view over the next 4 5 years India has a 
manufacturing resurgence. Okay, mm. the PLI schemes of the government. Absolutely. And the improvement. China plus one also yeah, to yes, some extent. Yes, yes, and and the fact that we're seeing manufacturing come back. Okay, a lot of our investee companies are, you know, doubling and tripling and quadrupling capacity with capital that's provided by the markets, and we see opportunity there. True. Do I think there's a place for them to grow? I think so. And so, having said that, there are a lot of themes. Uh, so, but more, it will be domestic demand-focused portfolio that we create, or we give equal importance to exports, which is IT, pharma, chemicals. How do we balance between these two? So, I would, I mean, look, uh, the way I would say it is, a larger part would be domestic. Domestic. But having said that, you can't preclude the external opportunity. Mm. Mm. Right, there are places where India is part of an integral supply chain. Uh, it's not impacted geopolitically in certain parts, and where you think there is equilibrium in profits, you would participate. You would in participate. It. So I wouldn't say I'd have a motherhood statement. I'll only buy domestic demand, not buy external demand. I don't think that's the case. And you're going to look at it bottom up. You're going to try and analytically figure the implications of the disequilibrium, and try and find uh, greater continuity in profits and then you play that investment theme so so to say 6 months from now i guess from this discussion jitu is betting we are going to be better than in terms of markets where we are 12 months from now we don't know 5 years from now we remain agile to navigate this markets but at the bottom of it we remain rather he remains extremely bullish on india and he is risk averse at this juncture and he is advising that we navigate this markets be as a corporate be as a investor and be as an economy cautiously is that how i sum it up i think that's a very fair summary very fair summary except i'll add one tiny addendum to this which is i would milestone it not timeline it on a five year basis mm -hmm. so we're going to look at milestones in our analytics to figure our next steps along this road map mm -hmm. rather than timeline it what we're expecting in five years could happen in seven or could happen in 18 months correct and so i don't think the timelines are set in stone and second point i'd add to this is we could be analytically wrong on certain as of our assumptions and if we're analytically wrong on some of our assumptions we're going to pivot and we'll Correct. come back and admit that we were wrong on something we think the road's going to change a little bit and we need to tweak our assumptions and tweak our road map and navigate through that so the critical milestones in this journey to start with is of course uh, a us recession maybe a slightly more toned down us fed but beyond that china and a uh, as more assertive and more uh financially accommodating china that in turn leading to maybe formation of an eastern bloc and which is what probably will be a key milestone as i understand from this discussion which can then start the process of deglobalization accentuating much more and as the world's global leader both economically and in terms of defense and strategy gets challenged it's not going to give up its position easily and that's where jitu believes that the last milestone could be which we all need to be watching is a probability of a world war 3 so guys it's not going to be an easy time we have to trade this time cautiously but at the same time volatility in markets if you make your friends and learn to navigate can also throw reasonably good opportunities so let's get braced up for a new world order and try to find equilibrium in this disequilibrium that is created in the geopolitical outlook of the world Thank you Jitu so much. You know thank you Abhishek thank you very much for the very kind words 
it's our pleasure and privilege to be here and thank you for having me on the show thank all you all the so best much.